Hello and welcome to the first of a series of lectures focusing on MSK musculoskeletal radiology. My name is Dr. Paramis Paran and I'm one of the senior radiology registrars working here in the University Hospital of Leicester. I have a specialist interest in musculoskeletal radiology and I'm hoping today that this lecture will not only assist you on your orthopedic placement but also set quite a key foundation for musculoskeletal radiology and more for the future assist you with your foundation jobs and of course very importantly for your exam. Now to start off with I think we'll, the aim of today is really to cover a structured approach of assessing a radiograph in the different positions or anatomical locations within the upper arm. We'll start off systematically with the shoulder moving up to the clavicle and then working down the upper arm ending with the distal phalanges and we'll also focus on soft tissue injury um, and pathology that can occur that you may encounter on radiographs. And before I begin talking through any pathology or any anatomy I think it's quite important to go through some of the basic radiographic principles. The first thing you've really got to understand and a lot of this will hopefully ring a bell because we should have covered this in the first two years already of our medical school teaching but an x-ray is produced within the x-ray tube and of course it passes through your region of interest in this case the upper limb we're particularly interested in the bones and it reaches a detector plate now once it hits the detector plate you will end up once it gets processed and you see this on your packs monitor you will end up with five main densities starting off with quite lucent densities such as that of air which classically is presented as black on a radiograph to a varying range up until foreign bodies such as metallic work which will be very radio dense. It's quite important to use those terms radio lucent, radio dense and we describe these in, in terms of densities and as a result you end up with a different range. Now I will just focus on these main five densities and that's going to give you uh, a focus in terms of describing radiographs correctly. In, in our case, we are very interested in, in the bones, but remember, it's not just the bones that you can see in a radiograph. You, of course, have soft tissue and fat. So here you can quite subtly see the fat within the, uh, the skin, just, uh, just underneath the skin, uh, pre presented as this slight lower density, not as low as the air, but just slightly lower. And of course, the soft tissue, in this case, we've got musculature presenting as a soft tissue density. The only other thing I'd like to mention, and we again we covered this previously, is really just to understand that any radiation x-ray that you're taking of course has a radiation dose and uh, extremities are have quite a low dose but it's very important to remember that of course if you do many of these and you request many of these subsequently in the same patient then it does add up. So it's quite important to really think about whether you are adequately performing the study for the right reasons and if this is the appropriate study uh, to be undertaken in terms of imaging. So I'd like to start off by just talking through the importance of two views. It'd be a bit a bit unusual and I'm sure you, you may have seen this image before. Why am I bringing up this picture of uh, Prince William? Well, it's quite important to know that you've got two views in a radiograph because what you're trying to do is image a 3D structure and view it on a 2D monitor and as a result of that we have to have two views and that's one of the most important things that I, I really want you to take back from this lecture because when you do see the second view you can clearly see that pathology may not actually be present. Now, how does this translate to radiographs? Well if we take an example of this phalanx it looks all quite well aligned, all the bones look aligned we have a look at the lateral and we can see everything is definitely subluxed out or in this case dislocated because there's no articulation with any of those joints. So it's really important that even when you look at a radiograph to always ask for two views. And I think that's one of the first things that a lot of people misunderstand, especially during the junior years of becoming a doctor. Um, and also once you're there on the ward, uh, when you're looking at fractures, always, always make sure that you've imaged uh, a joint within two views or image bones within two views. A couple of other things for recap. Um, again, this should have been covered in your first year, but really just understanding the different types of fractures that can occur. Here we've got a long bone. Um, again, you can apply this principle to the proximal humerus. This, this is, of course, the femur. Uh, but 
describing fractures is quite important. So whether it be a transverse fracture across the femur, whether you've got linear fractures, which are actually quite rare, quite commonly you get these oblique fractures, whether they're displaced or angulated has quite a lot of importance. If you think that there's a spiral position to the fracture line, then of course mention it as a spiral. And then in the pediatric population, you get green sick injuries. And then finally, if, if you've got multi-fragmented portions, then I would be quite specific in calling this a comminuted fracture. So if we were to, for example, take this radiograph over here, in terms of description, we would have to say this is a transverse fracture of the mid shaft of the diaphysis of the humerus. There is evidence of lateral displacement and posterior lateral angulation of the distal fra fracture fragment. There's also some proximal migration of the distal bone resulting in shortening of the bone. Here we've got a humeral shaft fracture, which accounts for about three to 5% of all fractures. Um, and these kind of fractures are actually associated with great risk of radial nerve injury. So a description should be specific, and we'll cover this a bit later on. Um, what you've got to try and imagine is trying to speak about the fracture over the phone, because commonly that's a lot of the time where you be in a position, especially on the wards, and a, one of the consultants will ask you to tell me about this radiograph, maybe over the phone, in which case you've got to give quite a systematic approach and we'll, we'll cover this a bit later on. But hopefully that's the kind of report, should I say, the kind of uh, communication that you should be able to give once you see these radiographs. And hopefully by the end of this lecture, we, we may be able to get to that stage. So the first thing we're going to do is cover a bit on the shoulder radiograph. Mm -hmm. um, so I appreciate the clavicle is slightly higher than the shoulder but I know this has a lot more bones and a lot more anatomy, so I think we'll start here. So let's start with the collarbone. Now, the collarbone is, of course, known as the clavicle. You have a medial and a lateral end of the clavicle. I'm just drawing it out here. And it articulates with this, which is your acromion. So we commonly call this joint the acromioclavicular joint. The next bit to be aware of is your scapula. Your scapula actually has quite a, a lot of protrusions and uh, a lot of components to it. So in addition to the acromion, which we've just covered, you've got the acromion process. This elliptical shape on its side is called the coracoid process and you've got a glenoid. Remember this is a 2D radiograph and therefore you're trying to image 3D structures, therefore you have an anterior and a posterior aspect of the glenoid. The glenoid is essentially forming the articular uh, articulation between the humeral head um, and the shoulder uh, and this essentially is your shoulder joint. Remember not all things uh, although they look like they have gaps um, doesn't mean that there's actually a gap there in this case we've got our labrum and we've also got uh, a joint here so therefore it's full of fluid a certain amount of synovial fluid to allow that lubrication and the smooth motion so don't always think that just because there's a lucency that there's a gap here that's not the case. In this case, we've got cartilage, we've got labrum um, within that joint and soft tissues are not quite well appreciated on radiographs. That's its, one of its limitations and hence we have better imaging modalities such as CT and MRI to assess the soft tissue in much better detail. Uh, moving on to the humeral head. So you've got the humeral head. There are both surgical and, uh, and anatomical necks. Surgical necks are typically where you end up tending to get the fractures. So you, your humeral head articulates with the glenoid, and then you have these two bony projections. The one just on the outside here is called the greater tuberosity, and then just medial to that, this is the medial aspect, and this is the lateral aspect of the radiograph. Just medial to that, you have the lesser tuberosity. Within this tuberosity, you have the bicepital groove, and this is where the long head of biceps tendon would run crosses over and attaches to that superior labrum. And that's <laughs> the main thing that will assist in that bicipital flexion of your elbow because of the way that these are attached. So that's predominantly your AP, so that's your anterior posterior radiograph, and that's what we would call this radiograph. You also have, remember, two views. So commonly you would get an axial view uh, to look for fractures. So a lot of people can get quite... Uh, confused by the the anatomy of the the axial view i think it's quite straightforward once you realize what you're looking at so the first thing to kind of work out is your humeral head so we've established that this is the humerus you've got the the dia uh, the metaphysis and then the diaphysis of the humeral 
shaft. Um, this is the greater tuberosity as mentioned before and then you've got that bicipital groove. So once you've established, remember there's a lot of over overlap in these axial views, so once you've established that the humeral head is this aspect, you then can focus on the, the bones just underneath this. Now in this case, actually it's the bones overlying the humeral head, so you've got the acromioclavicular joint. You've then got to work out which bit is anterior, so which is the bit that's uh, your chest and which is the back of your chest. So to work that out, you've got to look for this process. This is the coracoid process, which corresponds to this process here on the AP view. Coracoid process is always the most anterior structure. And then posterior to that, you have the acromion. So this, where I'm drawing it out, is the acromion. And up here, you've got the coracoid process. So once you've worked out where the acromion is, you know that the acromion articulates with the clavicle, and therefore this makes this the clavicle. This is the acromioclavicular joint. Remember, there's a tiny space there because there is cartilage, there's an articular disc that's present. Um, and then once you've worked that out, the final bit you've got to work out is what is this bone? So this is your humeral head that's now articulating with the glenoid. So this then makes this the glenoid. So again, remember, you'd have labrum and cartilage within this space. And this is essentially your, your ball and socket joint of the, of the shoulder. So it's quite important to appreciate this. On your AP view, the humeral head forms a very subtle overlap with the glenoid, and that, that's quite a well-centered uh, AP radiograph. There are specific other views that you can do. For example, you can get it specifically orientated so that you can get the anterior and posterior ellipse of the, hum of the glenoid perfectly aligned. We call this the Gracie's view. Um, and this may be specifically looking for any particular degenerative change or any uh, abnormalities within the glenoid. So there are specific views that you can get, but these are generally the two main that you need to be aware of. The one thing that I'd like to cover next is really how a humerus can look when it's internally or externally rotated. Now here, if you compare this to previous, it looks very different. This is still the same AP projection that we've got. But here we've got an internally rotated humerus. So in this case, this is the uh, lesser tuberosity. This is the greater tuberosity, this line here. And here we've got the bicipital groove just inside. And we'll, and classically, when you, when you think of this as an appearance, you would imagine it to be a light bulb. I will show you better examples. Um, and if you see this kind of appearance, you've got to question, one, has the patient actually taken the image in with internal rotation, or is there any suspicion for a posterior shoulder dislocation? Because that's the only other sign that you have, which is an internally rotated shoulder, and I'll come on to this a bit later on. So when you see this sign, just think, could this be a posterior dislocation? And that's quite an important thing to bear in mind. Okay, let's move on to external rotation. So externally rotated shoulder is quite quite similar to your your normal neutral position so you've got your greater tuberosity your lesser tuberosity we can see here how much and how well demarcated the greater tuberosity is now these views are quite useful at looking at at the greater tuberosity particularly and sometimes you can get what we call a hill sacs defect so when you have anterior shoulder dislocations this portion of the posterior lateral humeral head will dislocate anteriorly hit this inferior glenoid and then cause a little depression. Um, and as a result of that, you end up with a little indentation, and that's what we call a hill sacs defect. So it's quite a good view to, to look at it, but if you do see uh, a joint and it looks exactly like this and not quite, so if I bring you back to the previous radiograph, you see how there's a bit of overlap here. So here there's not much overlap. So just think, has the patient externally rotated? Um, and actually, if so, we can probably make a, a small assessment on this posterior lateral humeral head aspect here. So let's move on to some other views that you may be, uh, you may encounter. One of them is the Y view. We call this the scapular view. Um, it's a pertinent view looking at dislocations, um, particularly scapular fractures, which you're not able to always see on the AP view. Um, so you may not get an axial view in addition to your AP projection. You may get a, a scapular Y view. Quite a good view at looking whether this humeral head here has dislocated posteriorly or whether it's dislocated anteriorly. So again, let's go through some basic anatomy. How do you know what's anterior and posterior? Well, 
your color code process is the most prominent thing anteriorly. So all of you can, if you get your hand and start feeling, you'll feel a prominent projection um, and that's a color code process. If you put your hand around the back, you'll feel that that's your chromium and that's the easiest way of recognizing uh, whether you've got, uh, whether you know whether something is anterior or posterior. So this then makes this the acromion. Remember, the acromion then articulates with the clavicle. And as a result of that, this is your classical y, y view that you get. So you get the scapular blade, you get this process, which, you, which is part of your acromion, and you get this process, which is part of the coracoid. And that predominantly gives you the Y. And just overlying all of this, you have your glenoid, which is now on face. Um, and this humeral head then articulates with the glenoid on face. So it's not very good at giving assessment on the glenohumeral joint, but it is very good at giving you an idea of whether this humeral head is dislocated either posteriorly over here or anteriorly over here. One of the things to be aware of is actually the normal lucency of the greater tuberosity. Um, a few colleagues in mine have sometimes made the mistake of of actually calling this pathology and actually this is just a normal variant um, this subtle lucency here within the the greater tuberosity is actually normal and again all projectional now if it was to look a bit more aggressive if it had a sclerotic rim or if there was loss of the architecture then i'd be a bit more concerned in calling this a pathological bone lesion and further imaging is required but it's important to bear in mind that you can get this as a normal variant and this normal lucency that's present so again, quite a good AP projection. We've got that overlap sign. Um, and so this is now the right shoulder that we're looking at, the chromoclavicular joint. Remember that coracoid process. You've got your scapular blade and then your glenoid and your humeral head. So those are the main things that you've really got to take back anatomically. And that's how you can help with describing fractures. Now let's move on to glenohumeral dislocations. We've kind of touched upon it quite briefly. Um, I think there's only three that you really need to bear about, bear in mind about, and of, of which probably two, which is the anterior and posterior dislocation. It's quite rare to see the inferior dislocations, but the only reason I've, I've really put that in is because it's got quite a cool name, um, and uh, it's a good, there's a good way of remembering exactly what it is. So I'm going to start with this. So just pause the video for a second and just think in your head really what, what the main features are of this radiograph in terms of its fractures. Remember that it's not just the bones that we're looking at, we're also looking at the soft tissues. So this fracture here looks quite complex but actually it's quite straightforward when you think about it. Remember anatomy? So the first thing to note is that this humeral head has been displaced inferiorly. Okay, so that's the first thing to note. It's not in contiguity with the, glen the normal position of the glenohumeral joint and therefore has been inferiorly dis displaced. So that's an, an inferior displacement of the, the humeral head. In addition to that, there's loss of this normal congruity of the greater tuberosity. So there is now a fracture there. Um, so there's two main things that we found within the bones. But remember, so this is quite classical of an anterior dislocation. But remember, a radiograph always has more than just the bones projectionally and, and if we look carefully we can actually see quite a nice fluid fat level so this is the fat remember of that lower density and this is the fluid probably all hematoma um, but fat naturally will just rise up um, and this is quite an important finding to, to comment about because once you see this then you know that there's quite a significant joint effusion um, and now we've got a really consider whether there's going to be uh, well we know that there's quite a gross pathology now going on overall this this these are features of an anterior dislocation typically they they are anterior inferior in position in addition you've got the fracture of the greater tuberosity which is that bony protrusion that we've seen and you've got this subacromial lipohemothrosis which is this fluid fat level that you can see here so that's quite a, a nice anterior shoulder dislocation um, these are the more common ones that you tend to see without the big fractures. Uh, so as I mentioned previously, you, you tend to get a, um, a fracture where the clean, the inferior glenoid gets taken off. That's this portion here. So this is our axial view again. Remember that acromium, you've got the coracoid process here, the acromioclavicular joint, which is this articulation here. You've got the glenoid which is here, and this humeral head should be 
actually here articulating with this glenoid but it's not it's moved anteriorly we know this is anterior because remember the acromion is the most posterior structure of your shoulder always remember feel the back of your shoulder and when you look on a an axial view you will know that this is the acromion so this is now impacted in in front of the glenoid and and therefore we end up with something called a hill sacs deformity and as a result of the fracture of the glenoid you end up with a bony bankart deformity as well or bony bankart fracture and this is your classical anterior shoulder dislocation this patient will need to be relocated back into joint um, and as a result of that you will have this hill sacs deformity which remember as we spoke previously you can see in particular views so let's move on so we're moving on now to posterior shoulder dislocations and as i mentioned previously one of the things that we talked about was internally rotating the shoulder and as a result of internally rotating, you, you end up with this classical sign, which is called the light bulb sign. Um, and it's quite an important sign to remember, because the moment you see this light bulb, you've got to really think of two things. One, has the patient internally rotated? Two, is there a posterior shoulder dislocation? Now, when we look at the scapular Y view, if you remember from previous, and you can rewind and have a look at how the normal scapular Y view looked like, but this humeral head over here should be projected over the glenoid. What we shouldn't be seeing is this humeral head projected posteriorly over the glenoid because that suggests that this humeral head is now posteriorly dis dislocated and as a result of that you end up getting impaction on the anterior aspect of the humeral head on the posterior lip of the glenoid and subsequent to that you get something called a reverse hill sacs deformity and a reverse bony bankart. Posterior dislocations are actually quite rare, occurring in about 2-4% to 4 of shoulder dislocations. Main things you really need to be aware of is that they kind of occur with these three things. I guess the one that you're going to be mostly encountered in would be seizures. Um, but just remember the other two associations that commonly tend to come in exams, one of which is the electrocutions and uh, any violent muscular contractions. So unlike anterior dislocations, which are quite usually identified on the AP projection, the posterior shoulder, shoulder dislocations are actually quite difficult. And uh, you probably need further views to really identify exactly what's going on. This is a pediatric patient. And the reason I brought this up is, again, to demonstrate classical posterior dislocation. Here, you've, this is how the light bulb sign looks in a pediatric patient. Um, and classically, you end up with the humeral head posteriorly dislocated so let's just talk through anatomy again remember this is your acromion have a fill of your back the back is the acromion that's what you're feeling around your back and therefore this is the acromioclavicular joint and just anterior to this you have the coracoid process and now this is anterior this is posterior you've got the humeral head pushed back and therefore this is a posterior dislocation uh, again this patient will need to be relocated and again on the AP remember this light bulb sign this is how it looks in the pediatric population. Now the final thing uh, to talk about is an inferior dislocation. It's got quite a cool name and um, I've had this presented at a lecture previously and it's probably one of the things that stuck in my head but it really sounds like a, one of those Harry Potter um, kind of spells, luxatio erecta uh, and essentially it's a uh, it's a uh, hyperabduction, uh, which has strong associated neurovascular injury, brachial plexus. It's associated with other fractures. Um, and essentially, you end up with this glenohumeral joint, which is trapped under the coracoid process. Now, when it gets relocated back in, they typically end up with a fracture. In this case, you've got a greater tuberosity fracture, which is this very subtle loosening that you're seeing of the greater tuberosity. It is a very, very rare fracture. But the way that I remember this is it's rare. And when you see this arm hyperadducted, the patients will come in with their arm just hanging above their head, unable to, to bring it back down. And that's an inferior dislocation. Luxatio erecta. Just remember Harry Potter. And uh, hopefully you will try and remember that name and remember that once he's done that spell, he's got his arm hyperadducted and, and it's just kept in that position. Well, anyway, that seems to be the way that I tend to remember it. So in summary, let's just talk through these three dislocation types again. Of course, this is our Harry Potter one. This is the, the Luxatio erecta, where you've got that hyperadduction of the arm. This is an inferior dislocation. 
you all will not remember this now this is your light bulb sign this is your classical posterior dislocation as a result of an internally rotated arm and then the most common and probably the one that you definitely need to know is your anterior dislocation of the glenohumeral joint and here you've got inferior displacement but the gleno the, the humeral head is all anterior remember there's an associated hill sax deformity and uh, a bony bankart which is related to that inferior aspect of the the labrum so let's move down uh, we're going to move to the humeral head now so humeral head, humeral head fractures are classified based on the near classification. Now, I think classification systems are quite complex and uh, at your level, it's probably not worth remembering all the different classification systems quite readily available online. But I think it's important to be aware of the different things that will put them into different classifications, such as the location, whether the surgical neck is involved, how much of a dislocation is involved. And uh, in this, in the near classification, there's it's actually based on parts so whether there's displacement, if it's greater than a centimetre, then it gets classified into a more higher part type. Um, so let's just talk, look at this radiograph. So this is a AP radiograph. You've got um, this humeral head, which is fractured, uh, probably through the surgical neck. It looks quite complex. It's got medial dislocation just in terms of talking through anatomy. So the anatomical neck is the old epiphyseal plate and your surgical neck is the representation of the weakened area of the bone below the head. So that's the more common area that's involved in fractures rather than the anatomical neck. So here you've got this transverse fracture through the neck of the left humerus. There's dislocation of the humeral head away from the glenoid. So treatment wise, I mean, there's a couple of things you can do. It all depends on how we've classified this, but typically it's a discussion between closed rim pinning versus uh, open reduction, internal fixation, intramedullary nailing versus arthroplasty. So all of that will depend on the patients and performance status, etc. Um, so there's a lot of consideration that needs to be taken into account with regards to treatment. But I think from a description point of view, it's just important to determine if it's just how many parts in this case, it looks predominantly one part. There may be some other components which we may see on, on the other views. So let's look at more complex cases because I find these ones tend to be a bit more interesting. So this is a patient that had quite a significant road traffic injury. Um, and we evaluate the, the humerus and the proximal humerus. And we see this quite complex fracture. There's definitely a significant dislocation. Uh, when we describe dislocation, I'll talk about this later, but it's all in reference to where the distal aspect is compared to the proximal. So here we've got a, a lateral dislocated uh, or lateral uh, displaced fracture. Um, there is, it's got an oblique component. And when we look at the humeral head, it just looks very unusual. In addition to that, we also notice this uh, displaced fracture, the, predominantly the mid shaft of the clavicle. But what, what looks concerning is this humeral head just doesn't have that normal, well-rounded uh, appearance. Um, and therefore, you've got to then suspect, is this significantly comminuted, which is quite unusual to get that much comminution in, in a fracture because it's a, a joint, especially. But then having said that, this patient does have quite significant injury. You look at the rest of the film, there's a lot of soft tissue injury. You can see all this abnormal uh, hematoma and probably probably hematoma edema you've probably got a, an associated joint effusion um, so you think this is quite significant injury you keep looking there's a lot of abnormality within the lung and then boom this is your humeral head that is actually displaced into the apex of the left lung and so when they went into surgery they had to go into the left lung to actually fish out the humeral head and, and that's how it ended up coming out so this patient obviously would have ended up with uh, a huge prosthesis because this is just not fixable it's really important to have a look at the whole film and not just focus on just one area especially when you think things aren't adding up moving on um, let's talk about the fallen fragment sign quite an important sign because it steers you away from this being just a simple fracture to actually a fracture within some sort of pa pathology so we call these pathological fractures 
In this case, we've got uh, a patient with uh, a simple bone cyst within the proximal humerus, but you can clearly see there is a fracture arising just on its superior portions. What you specifically look for are these linear areas of high density within them. And what this is, is, is a small fragmented portion that's actually fallen within the, the simple bone cyst into its dependent portions. Uh, you can these are different types, all three different types of simple bone cyst or unicameral bone cyst fractures. But you can see these linear areas, and actually these are just floating areas of bone within the, the bone cyst. And it's quite pathognomonic for, for this being a pathological fracture, but actually within a, a simple bone cyst. And we call this the, the fallen fragment sign. So I'm going to quickly move up to the clavicle, um, just because there are a few things about the clavicle that we, we sort of need to assess. Uh, let's talk through some basic anatomy of the clavicle. So you remember you've got a, a medial, a mid shaft, and a lateral end of the clavicle articulates with the acromioclavicular joint, which is here, and sorry, articulates with the acromion. And remember the acromion then comes and performs that posterior aspect of the shoulder, and then you've got your shoulder blade, which would be here. You've got your glenoid and your coracoid process. Now your clavicle actually has a multitude of uh, ligaments that are attached to it. So um, there is a trapezoid and a conoid portion of these ligaments and you don't need to know this in too much detail but what's important to know is if you have injury to these ligaments then you will get caracula, uh, you will get clavicular displacement. Um, in addition to that there's also another ligament the acromio ligament and you've got acromioclavicular ligaments as well. So all of these can are sus suspect to getting injury um, and as a result of that so these are some MR images just demonstrating how the <coughs> the ligaments uh, appear on the coronal plane. You can see that this is your um, conoid conoidal portion and this is your trapezoidal portion. And when you get injury to this, you can it, it can give you an extent, an idea of how much displacement there is. So before we talk about ligamentous injury, let's just talk about the classical clavicular fractures. I don't think anyone's really going to have any issues spotting these. Um, they're quite easy to spot generally. The main thing to really notice is there's any significant angulation. Um, the clavicle is quite a common place where pathology can occur. Things like myeloma, metastasis. So really carefully inter interrogate and make sure you're not missing out on any pathological processes that could be within the bone in this region. So this is a significantly displaced uh, clavicular fracture with fracture fragments. It's predominantly within the mid shaft of the fracture and it's quite angulated. Um, here you've got a, a lateral end clavicular fracture um, in the oblique portion. Uh, the acromioclavicular joint in this case is actually preserved. Um, it's a strong ligament holding that in place, but because this fracture of the proximal segment is slightly lifted, it probably means that there's some injury to, to these uh, ligaments that we've briefly mentioned. A uh, few other examples of clavicular fractures, same patient in this case. Um, you can, again, the importance of having two views. So on one view, it may look okay, but the moment you take a second view, you can really appreciate how much displacement there is. Look for these tiny fracture fragments. That they need to be fished out. If they unite in, a, in an odd position, then they can give continuous pain for the patient or a, a palpable hard lump, which forms callus formation. Um, and uh, it's something that should be commented on and uh, something that could should be operated on if possible in terms of removing these small fracture fragments. So let's talk through ligamentous injury. The inferior margin of the clavicle in this case is above the acromion um, and this indicates that it's at least what we call a grade 3 injury. Now classically the best way of doing that is drawing a line from the inferior margin to the superior margin and if it's above this superior margin then that gives us a good idea that there is a ligamentous injury. Varying grades, I, I don't think it's important to know them off the top of your head. Just bear in mind as soon as you lift above that that this therefore then becomes the uh, a grade three type injury. So uh, one of the things that in terms of measurements worth taking is is taking a measurement between uh, the inferior aspect of the clavicle and the coracoid and this gives you an, ex an appreciation of the coracoclavicular distance. A normal coracoclavicular distance is around 10 to 13. 
if it doubles or if you have a significant increase like this then you're thinking there is significant injury and this is probably at least a grade three grade four there is uh, grades one to five again it's worth looking at it this is the rookwood classification so it's based on all these different ligaments that we've talked about and uh it's just worth, I won't go into too much detail, but it's worth just having a read about the different types of injuries and you can see how, how many of the ligaments are injured to give you an idea of uh, the different classification systems and the management that's associated with that. Anything between four, five, six, they tend to repair. Grade three, they don't tend to do much surgery, but that's something to consider. They don't tend to do much if it's a grade one or grade two. And just to comment on repairing these acromioclavicular joint injuries this is an example of a, a hook plate where you've essentially got quite a significant acromioclavicular in joint injury the hook plate is there and it just hooks just underneath the chromium to keep that all in place so it's worth mentioning if you think there's no fracture associated with these things it's worth mentioning the extent of how much the acromioclavicular distance is if there is how much the the distance between the inferior aspect of the clavicle to the superior aspect of the acromium is um, and just giving them a rough idea of of uh, how much injury and, and if you if possible giving them a grade of the injury as it will determine management now the next thing uh, we're going to do is move down slightly f to the elbow joint um, and one of the things to even start off with is actually focus on dislocation so what we've got to do is determine whether the dislocation or where is the dislocation so if we look at this radiograph is this humerus anteriorly dislocated or is this radius and ulna posteriorly dislocated so the answer to this is a, this is what we call a posterior elbow dislocation and this is all in relation to the post to the naming convention which essentially is determining that everything is relative to the proximal bone so wherever this humerus is anything distal to that in this case the radiant radius and ulna is all posterior and therefore this is a posterior elbow dislocation you can apply that anatomically to any joints um, based on the anatomical position now it would be fair i think to describe these uh, these dislocations as well so for example the humerus is anteriorly dislocated to the radius and ulna or the radius and ulna is posteriorly dislocated to the humerus. And I think that's absolutely fair because you're giving a relation of the proximal and lateral segments. So just bear that in mind. But if you're going to say this is a, an elbow dislocation, I think it's important to say this is a posterior elbow dislocation. So let's quickly whiz through a normal elbow radiograph and focus a bit on anatomy. So this is our lateral radiograph, which you probably will see quite a lot of, not only in the adult population, but also in the pediatric population, which I won't cover in this lecture. Um, so before we focus on these different lines, let's just talk through some gross anatomy. So you've got the supracondylar region of the, the distal humerus, which is this area here, quite important to look for any supracondylar fractures. You've got the condyles, so the condylar region, uh, comprising of your, your trochlea and your capitulum. Um, you've got your olecranon, your coronoid process, your radial head, radial metadiaphysis, and then the radial shaft. There's the radial neck is also present here. And that's predominantly what you can really all see on the, on the lateral. Remember, it's not just about the bones. There's also soft tissue. So if I quickly have a look at this, you've got an anterior and a posterior fat pad of which you can just see it as a very subtle hypo density, so a lower density compared to the normal soft tissues and that's predominantly fat. Remember this from the descriptions that I gave at the very beginning of the lecture. So your fat sits within that electron and fossa and when you extend the elbow that electron and process fills the, the gap and then it does actually push out the fat. Now if you do have a flexed elbow and you're seeing the fat pad sign, especially the anterior fat pad, it means that something else is pushing it most likely joint fluid is pushing that fat away uh, i'll show you some examples of that couple of lines you need to be aware of the anterior humeral line which is this line just formed just anterior to the humerus should cross at least a third of the capitella which is this area here and you have your radiocapitular line which runs direct if you draw a line directly through the, the center of the radius it should 
form a nice congruent articulation through that uh, trochlea and capitular process. So in this case is the capitulum again because the radius articulates with the capitellum. So that anterior fat pad is quite important because it's important to look for elbow joint effusions and it's an indirect sign. So here you can see a posterior fat pad which does look quite prominent but you don't normally see this anterior fat pad so prominent. This is therefore a prominent anterior fat pad and therefore consistent with a large elbow joint effusion. Let's quickly talk about elbow dislocations. So in this case we've got an elbow dislocation where based on the naming convention this is a posterior shoulder dislocation. Remember this everything is all in relation to this proximal segment over here. So this is your distal humerus, supracondylar region, your condylar region, and then this is your olecranon, which is now all posteriorly displaced. Um, you can just about make out a very tiny or subtle fracture fragment over here. There's a bit of uh, a bony malalignment here as well. Um, and therefore, this is all in keeping with a posterior dislocation. When you think of posterior elbow dislocations, you've got to think of the terrible triad. Most of the time, it's a posterior dislocation, a radial head fracture, and a coronoid process fracture. Um, so here we've got uh, a CT just really demonstrating this, these bony fragments. This is the coronoid process fracture that you can see. And this is a complex radial head fracture with a fracture fragment here within the joint as well. Um, so they look for these terrible triads because they will give you a good idea of uh, how extensive these injuries are. And it may just not only be the one dislocation that you're seeing, but actually small fracture fragments as well. Um, I'll move on to radial head dislocations. So here you've got... Uh, if you think of that radial capitular line on your lateral radiograph, it definitely is malaligned. So that's a beautiful demonstration of how the radial head does not, the radial capitular line does not articulate or is, is not in line with that ca capitulum over here. And this is how it would look on your AP. Remember two views. So although it may look normal on your AP projection, it's really important to have that second view. Radial head fractures. Um, they are quite important um, in t determining exactly what's going on because you may not actually see them on an initial glance. So here, although there's a very subtle lucency there, I think it's quite difficult to really call. I can't see any intra-articular extension of the fracture line. Um, what we do have is a very subtle anterior fat pad sign. But again, it's difficult to say it's, the projection is a bit off because it's not the normal uh, lateral projection that we have. The, the radius is just very slightly raised, but it is articulating well with the, the capitulum. So there's no radio capitular line disruption. The patient then subsequently had um, a radiograph a week later and that fracture fragment became much more obvious. Um, so although in this case no definite fracture can be seen through the, the radial he head, it still looks very ill-defined and it just makes everything a bit more. But this is a, uh, a radial head fracture. And the suspicion should be high in cases like this. Now let's move on to an elbow fracture. Same thing uh, with a radial head fracture. This time you've got an intra-articular radial head fracture. Here you've got a, a mildly displaced intra-articular fracture of the radial head. Um, there is a, a definite step which you can see and there's definite raised anterior fat pad so there is a, an anterior joint effusion or a joint effusion and the key there is a classification system there's something called the mason classification again don't get too bogged down with this but it will determine um, in terms of resection or replacement of the radial head with regards to displacement and that's the key in terms of uh, the management with these patients now I'm just going to summarize uh, the last few slides on elbow fractures. So with elbow fractures uh, in the pediatric population, again, I'm not going to cover too much of this, but whenever you see that anterior fat pad sign, you've got to think, okay, is there a supracondylar fracture? In this case, you can definitely see a step in that supracondylar region. The radio capitular line looks okay. The anterior humeral line also looks just about okay, but I think it's a bit wide. It should be like this. 
where when you draw that line along the anterior border, um, it should intersect along the long axis of the capitulum, which in this case is, is not quite doing that. So the mid third area should be the, the area that this line should go through. And that gives us the, the sign of a supracondylar fracture. Again, this will be covered in your pediatric lectures. So here, is this an anterior fat pad that's raised? Well, actually, in this case, this is not an anterior fat pad that's raised. You can see how different this looked compared to the previous examples that I've shown. Uh, this is a normal anterior fat pad and it should not be confused. So I'm going to pause there um, and I think this concludes part one of the upper limb lecture. Um, we will continue with part two, focusing on the lower forearm in terms of fractures, focusing on the wrist and also the metacarpals, and then finally talking a bit about soft tissue injury and bony pathology. But I hope this summarizes uh, the importance of the different types of fractures that you've encounter you can encounter in the upper arm and also the importance of elbow dislocations. So I hope to see you very shortly in part two.